mute. There it is.
Ron Nagel, Sigmar Polk, and Tal Adnan, Emily Mae Smith, Nina Schutzen, and Brad Wellman. They have supported the careers of over 100 emerging artists by donating works from their collection to various museums, including the Whitney Museum of Art and the RISD Museum. And a part of the collection can be found not too far away on the walls of all those private private <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> This is a really interesting bio. I have a feeling Laura wrote it. I wrote it. Is Laura mentioned? <laughs> Stephen Adler became besotted with contemporary art after picking up an early issue of Freeze magazine on a newsstand in the 1990s. It was the heady time of the young post punk British artists, and Stephen was fascinated but also intimidated by that world. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. He started a modest collection of outcomes. He started a modest collection of British studio ceramics and carried on with his work life of opening and managing restaurants for Wolfgang Puck and Danny Mayer. Meyer. 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 I don't have the copy of this where I wrote how to pronounce everything. I left on my sheet, so you have to bear with me. So fast forward 10 years, and Stephen and his wife, Laura Belgrade, had developed a case of chronic heart depression. As in many cases, the fever started mainly via one hours. In this case, Miguel Abreu and one artist at that gallery, R. H. Freeman. Since that initial infection in recent years, Stephen and Laura have nurtured an eclectic collection of artists, including Alan Madani, Thornton Dial, Lydie Churchman, Mary Edelson, <laughs> Willis Wallach, Tyler Mitchell, and Sonia Kandarovsky. Recently, they started to donate to institutions such as the Whitney Museum and that in the last one. Melissa Perovic is a former professional athlete with 15 years of experience in marketing strategy and partnership development in healthcare technology and pharmacy. In addition, she has a master's in art business from Sotheby's Institute of Art. As an art collector and patron, Melissa began collecting in 2017 and has largely focused on young female artists who live and work in New York. Melissa lives in New York City with her husband, Dr. Edna Reeder, their daughter, Maxine, by the way, Dr. Reeder is amazing for <laughs> Their daughter Maxine and a curated selection of works by artists, including Izzy Wood. Parmeline, Dominique Fong, Liz Glasner, and Sierra Fong. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> And our goal is to have a natural discussion where anyone, regardless of what stage they are in, in terms of art collecting, including people who have never collected before, can get something out of this and come away with some sort of actionable advice. Um, so here's my first question, and it's for Eileen. Experienced collectors often recommend that the first step to collecting is to not buy anything. The first step is actually to see as much as possible. Now, this might sound like counterintuitive advice, but it's because you need time to develop your eye. Otherwise, you'll start buying whatever you get access to without building the cohesive collection that makes sense. Eileen, I'm curious. Do you agree with that advice? I know you're constantly traveling and seeing everything possible for your clients. And what have you done when, for example, a new client came to you to help them develop their case and really understand what it was that they were Okay. Is it on? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're on that, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Good. So great question. Um, and it does happen. I mean, a lot of us here, I recognize many, but I'm sure there are new people. And you know, as an advisor, I've been working in the industry now a really long time since the mid '90s. And there are times people obviously are very have a, a well-educated eye already, but when new clients come it really is super important to educate themselves. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, especially as a professional. I actually tell them I don't want them to buy anything for the first six months. I think it's really important for us to go to museums, go to gallery shows, go to auctions, <laughs> see as much as we can see. I send them links online if they're not in New York and I can't be with them all the time. 
to really understand what intrigues them, what speaks to them. And then on the flip side, I always make sure that we're together. We go look at art because as we all know, you can look at a JPEG and it looks nice, but a work speaks to you in person. It's the dynamism, it's the act, how it activates the space around it, how it, it speaks to you. Maybe I love it and you won't. I think it's so important for a new collector to really see as much as they can see, whether you're collecting or whether you just want to, to learn and be um, more knowledgeable in the art world. It's, it's even as a professional, I mean, most of my friends and colleagues know I am out in Chelsea almost three, four times a week. I'm uptown, downtown. I was just in Brooklyn, actually, now visiting um, an art space. You're never done what, at whatever stage you're at. You constantly learn, and I think that's we're so privileged to have that opportunity to see so much of them. Yeah, especially being in New York City, where there's so much to see. Also, you can see things not just other spaces with the auction houses. Um, so that question was about seeing artwork. Now I want to switch to talking about artists themselves. Um, and I was hoping to believe so you could answer this question. So some collectors want to get to know artists. And, for <laughs> and other collectors do not know. Um, and other collectors say that they can have the drawback of affecting how they see the work, especially if the relationship right now only comes sour. Um, <laughs> what has your approach been to that? Do you like to get to know artists? Do you like to build a relationship with gallerists? And what, I guess, could you please speak to your experiences with that as well? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, I'm definitely a relationship person. So for me, getting to know the artist is always special, and especially living in New York City. It really has been a privilege, and I've met you know so many really smart, really talented artists, and a lot of them are female artists. So of course, that's like super exciting to me. But I think I'm just you know wired to want to know more. And once I see a work of art that really speaks to me, I think you know it like raises all these other questions. I'm like going home talking to them and thinking like, how did they do that? I really want to know more. So for me, definitely. It doesn't have to happen, but it's always a bonus. And I actually think it really shaped the way my husband and I collect. It started, you know, when we were first dating, we were kind of, you know, we can only go to so many branches. So it's like, what else can we do for like our dating programming? So we ended up going, of course, to museums, galleries. <laughs> and we really didn't know much except, you know, Chelsea. And so we were going to Chelsea, and to me, it really felt unapproachable, you know, like galleries are very serious, the atmosphere is very serious, and you know, for someone back then, you know, even before 2017, someone who was just starting out, who was just totally in all of art, I'm like, I'm even, am I even qualified to go to a gallery, you know? So then understanding very quickly that most of the Chelsea galleries and artists are not going to be who I'm going to be able to connect with. And just purchasing a work of art and just making it about the transaction also made no sense, or it wasn't really as rewarding or maybe even inspirational. So very quickly I understood that there are other areas that work for me, which of course not try that by then the lower east side, and that's really where I feel like I found a way. And again, this is not like a strategy, you know, it's not, it's for me, everything is like purely purely emotional. Because the rest of my life is like, you know, rational and regimented, and I have a job, and I have, you know, like all these things, and then art is really a way or a place where I get to, you know, dream and think about all these inspiring things and like meet all these great people. So really finding that, finding Tribeca and finding the Lower East Side, and now like some of my most amazing friends who happen to be here in the audience, like Ali or Wendy, and like the POW and Chapter, and somehow. Oh my God, he's here. So no, I'm not a relationship person. <laughs> and that's sort of the beauty of it because there's no one right way to collect. Um, it's really a personal experience. Even not even with respect to the work that you collect, but even how you go about collecting is so personal to each individual. Um, so Stephen, I recall a few years ago you mentioned to me the type of research that you do when you first discover an artist or go about thinking about acquiring their work. And when I heard the word research, 
I automatically thought, um, oh, so you can look up their CV and you see which MFA program they graduated from. Uh, clearly, I misunderstood because I called you and I said, can you explain to me what you meant by research? I was thinking of it in the very like lawyerly like way. Um, and you had such a brilliant answer and it gave me so much more depth in terms of how I thought about discovering new artists. So I was hoping you could share that answer. But, what did, what did you say? I think for me, research means I read everything. Um, I read all the magazines. Um, I read whatever is in the New York Times. What are the magazines? Well, some people might not. Some people might not know. Is, you know, we say art publication. I mean, art forum freeze. Um, let's see. Um, I don't read them. Avenue, what? I think one of the artists in there was an Avenue. So, but I read a lot of that. I read a lot of text, not textbooks, but um, biographies. I read about, a lot about art history. Um, I look at Instagram, which is a blessing and a curse. Um, but I also am a complete geek. So I will do deep dives on artists that people generally don't know about or, and are undersung, and it's only because I like things that other people don't know about. It's the way I feel about music. It's the way I feel about books. Um, and so the less people that know about it, the more intrigued I am by it, and I try to champion those, those people. So um, I do a lot of cross-referencing. So if I see somebody on Instagram, and then I see somebody else that I really respect, who also follows them and is and is looking at it, it makes me want to go deeper and that cross reference with the magazine. And so it's not about finding what is going to be the cool flippable thing. It's about a group of people that I really trust, and I trust their opinion, their eye. Um, and that's what needs me to carry on and really start to look at something seriously. So Stephen mentioned two things. Um, you just used the word flippable. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what that is? I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk. It's a new I would say, as an album lawyer, I would. I object. I would say. Uh, what, what, um, they all wish it would there is, there is a, a noun flipper, and then there's flipping as a verb. Um, and this is somebody who buys something speculatively and thinks it's going to be sellable for, for a much um, higher amount. And um, it's usually frowned upon, although it's become so ubiquitous um, that everybody's kind of like, yeah, sure, it happens and it's going to continue to happen. Um, and it's not necessarily, I think what would be interesting to talk about is when is something a flip and when is something not a flip. Because I'll be honest with you, and I have sold things um, and for a much higher amount than I bought them for, and it's always, always, always to buy more art. So in that sense, I think flipping has a bad name. Um, but you, know, you try to wait a certain amount of time, generally try to go back to the gallery and see if they can do it for me. So it's all on the up and up. I don't put things in auction. Um, so there's different ways of approaching it. And it's a very um, uh, fluid word. And uh, it's, it's flipped around too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it also depends on the person. Like the, sure. You know, two different people could do the same things. And one person is freaking and the other person right. is not. Right. <laughs> The other thing that you mentioned, and I guess this will segue into the question that I have for Ava, is you mentioned that you look at the Instagram accounts yes. of people that you respect. Yes. So do you mean collectors? Do you mean curators? Yes, all of it. Um, also artists. Um, I like to see what art, other artists are looking at. I like to see what galleries um, are looking at. And um, uh, so do you. Yeah. So, I had uh, a few years ago a private collection management platform called Origin, and I was I could see you know what people were collecting, and sometimes there would sort of be like a bubble. So this emerging artist, 
you know, hadn't had a New York solo show um, yet or was about to have one, then people would start to find that artist. And I would call the collectors on the platform and say, hey, how did you find out about this artist? And uh, one of the things that I kept hearing was, oh, well, I know so-and-so collects this artist, or right. so-and-so posted it on his or her Instagram account. And that was so eye-opening because we, we, right or wrong, but for some reason, collectors really aren't part of this conversation in terms of, I don't want to say trend setting, but there's a lot of research that's done and discovery that's done. And so when you see someone else who you respect also interested in that same artist, it's kind of a better confirmation than perhaps, you know, like market confirmation, mm -hmm. right? That, the, that, that this artist is in demand and the price went up. Sometimes it's more confirmation to see, oh, this like collector who I really respect is interested in this artist. And now, you know, I was I was smart because he's out there. <laughs> um, so, sort of on that topic, Papa, I noticed that you and Manuel, uh, who've been collecting for over two decades, as I mentioned, um, especially in the last several years, you've really narrowed your collecting focus, and your collection is so intentional. Can you tell us about your collection and explain how you got to this point, <laughs> and what factors you now consider when you're collecting and adding? Definitely lots of mistakes made during the way. So, it's so for sure, it's, um, it's a good question. I, I don't think it, I think it happens organically. You, you don't get up one day and say, okay, well, I'm really going to focus on making everything, you know, like whatever, like, yeah, that he said, or like something that I'm really care about. It, it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of mistakes, it takes a lot of. Um, <laughs> It's not that simple. I don't. I don't know how to answer that, but but, but it happens. Because when I first started collecting, people would say, "Well, what are you going to collect? You know, are you, what is, what is you know? You have your you know friends and women who live in New York City. Some people have oh, only works on paper. Or some people have oh, I'm just going to buy small paintings made by you know, something. But that was the first question you ask, and, and it's the wrong question. Do not. I, I mean, that's, do not do that. That's not going to work. I think what's best is, is that, you know, you look, 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 and you can, you're okay to look at Instagram and see what your friends are buying and, or, or what is the next trend. It's okay to do that because, because you will make mistakes. Like, I promise you that's not going to be the right way of doing it. But, but go ahead and do it because that's the only way you're going to learn. And 20 years later, because we have the resources, don't get me wrong, because it's not as simple as like, oh, I want to buy polka. It's just not going to happen. You know, no one's going to sell it to you. You're not going to have the money for it. So you start small. You start buying things that, you know, galleries. I mean, you know, Stephen said that he does research, right? But I, I say galleries have done the research for you. Go support the galleries that you love. You know, come to places like this gallery or smaller galleries or mid-sized galleries or even big galleries have things that can sell you for a small, you know, for it. Not, not crazy prices. It's rarer and rarer now, but I always say galleries, galleries, galleries. And if you and if you're afraid to go into the galleries, then maybe find a friend who has more of you know the courage to go in there or an advisor that might work with you even at a smaller level. I mean those are all things that are I've learned the hard way. You know, yeah, I try and get into the gallery and I'm like, oh I want something, you know, like look at me, I'm a young collector. Back then, not now. <laughs> that worked, but then it stopped working after a while. <laughs> so, so it's always nice to like. You know, I tried everything. Trust me. <laughs> so, and some of the things that work is just just focus on a gallery you like, someone that you get along with, and then work with them because they've done the job for you. Don't forget that. Don't, don't, you're not gonna go there and then try and make, find the next Warhol. You know, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, well, and I mean that. Yeah, no, I mean, if you want something you like, you're gonna go after, it, right? So, and some, most of the time you're gonna lose, but some of the time you won't. But um, those. Are the <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying is right. I mean, he's giving really great advice. I mean, he, we are a relationship-based community, collecting community. We all are interested in art. We all love to speak. You learn by speaking to artists. You learn by speaking to galleries. What you're saying is 
perfect on the spot. Find guys you connect with and get to know them, get to know their program. I'm not saying just buy everything from that program, but once they get to know you, they want to help you so that when they find this really amazing new artist, they call you and they say, oh my God, you have to you know, look at this artist's work. We're going to have a show in a year or this artist that we've had for many years is having a museum show. They all engage with you as much as you engage with them, but you have to make the effort. FaceTime in anything, whether it's in the arts or any type of industry that you're in, the more you're with people and you sit, you have a coffee, you talk to them, everybody wants to share information. Face-to-face -face is something that you can't put a dollar sign on. It gets you everything. That, that's my experience. And maybe you don't get that hot artist that only makes six works and you're begging, but you show them that you're interested by going and maybe you'll get it the next time or maybe when they have another really interesting artist that they share with you, then you'll get that opportunity there. But you have to put the time in. And if you don't have a time, depending if you know you go with an advisor, that's not a plug for me, by the way, but I'm just saying at a certain level, some people don't have the time to do that. But when you're starting out, make the time. Because if you want to get involved and learn, you have to find your pockets of going to the auctions or coming to galleries or going to museums or definitely online. I love seeing what artists, by the way, post. I sure. think, you know, if you can meet artists, talk to them, who are their friends? And who did they like? Or who, artists always post, oh, my friend has a show here. And I learn a lot from that. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I want to go see and pay attention to that artist. And always pay the galleries the next day. Yes, <laughs> yes, as fast as you can. <laughs> as fast as you can. They'll remember you for sure. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. So, um, besides collecting a lot of work or sessions, acquiring work, you also do a lot of PA sessioning. You donate a lot, of, I mean, a lot, a lot. Um, I think. Over 100 different emerging artists are now in institutions because of you. So, can you talk to us a little bit about what that process is like? And maybe this is also one of those counterintuitive things where it's like, well, I bought the artwork, so why are they talking about donating it now? Why would, why would you? Why would you part with something that you, you know, uh, like so like enough to collect? Well, as as. But as an emerging artist collection, yeah. what I want to find is the, the new one, right? So that, that's always been my drive. Like, okay, this is the artist I love. And I kind of fall out of love after a bit, you know, just being honest. So, <laughs> so what happens then, you know, you just give this back to the gallery. It's, yes, you can. They don't like it because honestly, they don't make as much money as when they first sold it. No, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No. So, but, but the reason why, I mean, there's also a reason why we get tours because IRS gives you an amazing reason why to donate to, you know, or give it to museums because they give you the tax uh, break. So that's one of the other reasons. Is so that I you but buy it? And you also do that with Florgettes. Well, yeah, no, no, I know, but 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 would I? I always wonder, would I do it if that wasn't there? Like, if I was living in Europe, would I? Do, would I, do, I don't know. I don't. I, don't I think you would, because I've seen you, you would do it. You know, I've seen you donate people okay. just to I'll get that desire. <laughs> 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 something else he's that is he's he's cooking dinner on Saturday. No, I know. But no, but something great that he does, and I love that he donates. I mean, it's amazing what he's done because you put a lot of these young artists on a great platform, but you also get is it's beneficial, it is it is a tax benefit, it is wonderful what you're doing. You also get street cred with the artists and the gallery because they're like, Whoa, that's amazing. Look at what he's done, he's lived with this work. Then he's donating it for the public to see, to get more exposure. That helps every artist to say, I mean, you donated so much to the Whitney, to Rizzi. That's huge. You know, I wish more people do it. It, it uh, is. But I also get, you know, you also get the galleries love you too. Well, that's what I mean. The galleries love you enough. Oh, yes. So yes. you weren't just the artist, the gallery. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it works it's in many like, different even, ways. Even with that sound, though. <laughs> 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 I 
I want to do this on purpose. I can't imagine anyone not like you. Um, but okay, so I want to ask. I want to step back and I want to ask more of like a problem focused question. I'm going to ask this on the video right here. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> no, we're going to talk about all of your problems in this case. <laughs> Let's resolve them. <laughs> so when it comes to modern art or art. Um, of particularly earlier periods, there are often questions about provenance, which is the chain of ownership, or authenticity, and sometimes title. Uh, with contemporary art, apart from some very rare notable examples, like the Nobler Gallery, authenticity or forgeries really are rarely a problem. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because when we and I started collecting, uh, some of our friends would be like, well, aren't you worried about buying a fake? And we would say, no, because the artist is living and we bought it directly from the gallery that represents them. And even if it's not a living artist, it could be from the gallery that represents their estate. So what's the, if you're buying a Renaissance work, right? You're thinking about provenance, authenticity, condition. What are those similar types of issues when you're purchasing a contemporary artwork? Well, first of all, you do still have to pay attention to provenance condition always. Um, I mean, for young artists, we're all very fortunate that we can ask the gallery and all that, but there is so much of young art being sold on the secondary. So you also want to make sure sometimes there are times when people have bought from an artist directly from their studio and the artist doesn't consider that a mature work, mm -hmm. uh, which does happen. Um, there are issues with, you know, contemporary artists are very creative, they use different ephemeral materials. You also have to think forward a little bit, um, because the work for conservation purposes, I mean, having been in the auction industry for 20 years, believe me, not everything ages well, so you have to always take that into consideration when you're spending what you're spending. So that is something, obviously that's not the motivating factor, only motivating factor, but that is a factor. Um, if something sounds too good to be true when you're offered it, it is, <laughs> and that happens. You know, if they call you, they're like, "Oh my God, there's this herring or Basia or even Damien Hurst has been copied." I mean, you do still need to do a little bit of your homework and do due diligence. Um, so I think you know, just be aware, have conversations. I think the great thing is you can pick up a phone and call dealers. You can call friends. You can call people in the auction industry and ask advice. Um, which I think is a very important thing to do when we're talking about secondary, not when you're going to the gallery and buying directly from them. Secondary okay, secondary, most of you probably know what secondary means. You bought it from Tamar and Chris, you buy this painting, and then you sell it, whether you sell it in auction, you sell it to Avo or Steven, you sell it to, you know, however, <laughs> you sell it in some way. There is a chain that has happened. So, Primary are when you come to primary dealers, um, wherever it is in the world, and you're buying the artist has consigned the work to uh, the gallery, or you've gone to the studio and you've bought it directly from the artist. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a question for everyone, but I'd like to answer it first, and then we can get to it too. <laughs> um, so every collector, and sort of been alluded to. So every collector, regardless of their experience collecting or the resources they can develop to collecting, runs into the problem of access. Access means that you can't get every work you want to get or every artist's work you want to get all the time. Um, so what normally happens when someone starts to collect and finds like, all these really in-demand artists is they go to the gallery and the gallery says, well, I have a huge wait list. Um, where all those on the top, you know. Um, <laughs> and so you, Yelena, you're not really like, you have to build more of a relationship with me before I can think about selling, you know, that type of work to you. And so they'll often recommend um, different artists in their program and you can purchase that work with the hope of maybe getting access to um, more in demand and you return to the market artists later. So, Everyone experiences issues with access. So I was curious to hear from each one of you, and hopefully we can start with you, Melissa, is how do you overcome this problem? First, do you encounter issues with access? And second, how do you circumvent or overcome those types of problems? 
for sure. <laughs> no doubt I have been um, seen as unfit to own the work or there has been you know, a huge long wait list or whatever the case may be. So of course I've experienced issues accessing the work I like. However, at the very beginning, it was so confusing because I simply didn't understand, like, how can there be a wait list or I don't understand what's going on, like, you know. So I think it really just took a little while to understand kind of like the behind the scenes. And then because I was able to, you know, develop relationships with galleries and artists, then I very quickly obviously learned how exactly things work behind the scenes, which is each gallery I feel like has maybe two or three artists who are like the stars and they get overwhelmed by, you know, when they have the show with that star artist, they kind of get overwhelmed by, you know, requests or big requests and I think it's really difficult for a gallery to be able to, you know, make their collector happy but also introduce the work to a new collector. So I feel like there's a very delicate balance on the gallery side that galleries have to deal with all the time. However, I also feel like there is a way in which that can be handled. If a gallery tells me, which has happened so many times and to this day I don't understand, when I am at the fair or you know meeting a new gallery and inquire about the work, when the answer is like, oh no, there's a wait list, we, we, we can't. And so to me, I'm like, but wait, you don't even know me. I actually want to know more about your program and about what you're doing but I find that to also be off-putting, you know. If a gallery says to me, you know, there's really a wait list and it's just not going to happen, however, are you interested in taking a look or whatever, if, if there is any room to continue the conversation, I certainly appreciate it. And I'm a thousand percent open to hear more, to learn more, but I feel like it really has to be like some sort of, uh, they have to keep the door open for me to kind of continue to, to be interested and want to know more and learn more. So I think that that's really, for me, how the conversation is handled is really what I just want to. So I, I have a very interesting perspective because I wear two hats. Yeah. I collect, which I have since the mid-90s. Um, I come from a collecting family, but <clears throat> since I started working in the galleries, I started collecting the artists that I uh, worked with at, at YQ in the mid-90s when people were like, who is Damien Hurst? I'm like, oh. You'll know one day it's okay. <laughs> In any case, so as a collector, the issue that I come up with is I know all the dealers very well. I know the artists. Um, and what I have happened to me always is they're like, as I have clients, I'm like, what about Mr. XYZ or you know, and every news everybody knows who they are, and the, the artist would be so excited to have it in those collections. I'm like, well, what about me? And everybody comes and sees. So it's funny having to juggle that duality because I have to juggle as a personal collector and as a professional to my clients. So um, I tend to not be able to buy on the level of some of my clients who are buying at the, you know, the highest echelon of the collecting. So um, I, again, it, it's, it's a dance. You know, A lot of these dealers that I come up with these situations with, I do so much business with them that a lot of times I will get it. I may not get it right away, but I'll be patient, and then I will get it. Um, and a lot of times, like everybody on this panel, we befriend artists, and that always helps as well. So hopefully, if we're in the position that we knew, know the artist or have met the artist, that they're comfortable with you, you're able to sort of um, finagle it. But it, it happens. You know, there's new artists all the time that we all want, everybody, you know, on this panel. And there's only so much work that they can sell. So we have to be patient, and certain things are not meant to be and or we'll enjoy it on your wall or your wall or the museum's wall and we'll move on because there's a lot more exciting things you know to, to consider. It's just so fascinating to hear that you know, someone like you also runs into problems with Well yeah because I can't tell you my clients' names but there's three of them that they're always like what about XYZ? They would be amazed and I'm like they would but they would look so much better in my office. <laughs> <laughs> it just it depends you know so I, I have to I have to you know I have to be um, straightforward with that as well. So, do those X, Y, Z people who shall not be named, mm -hmm. do they run into issues with access? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> because it's the kind of thing that if you I'm say, <laughs> if, if you say they're in that person's collection, everybody's like, everybody's like oh. 
you know. Actually, can I say something about that though? Because I just want to say, as we've all been in positions, and if you're starting your collecting journey, a lot of galleries will say, oh my God, that painting is a, you know, a name that we all know. But, and it, it is very enticing and it's exciting. But what you all have to consider is that person has ex exuberant resources and has maybe a thousand young artists in, you know, in storage. So I just want to say that is exciting when it is in that person's collection, but they may not only have, you know, be building a, a small, concise collection. It just depends. It just always weigh when you're told that information. Just take with a grain of salt. Is, is all I'm um, when we were and I started collecting, we obviously met some collectors who are so just prolific collectors. And they, you know, you see them at the fairs and around 12, 1 o'clock, they're like, hey, what did you buy? Because I got this, this, and this, this. We're like, oh my gosh, we're trying to get this one piece, you know, for maybe a tenth of the value of one of the works that you just bought. And so there, there's like this pressure to be able to, you know, I don't want to say like keep up with your friends, but at the same time, as you just mentioned, they're buying so many things and they're buying for a lot of different reasons. We're buying because we're living with the work and we only have like so much space and we don't have anything in storage. So it's just, you know, it's just, a different approach. approach. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, because I'm a Libra, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not me, but I'm always trying to balance things. I always feel for the gallery. I really feel it. Because if you have six paintings and 30,000 people, yeah. it's the worst position yeah. to be in. But also because for most of my life, I was in the restaurant business, mm -hmm. and you would have people that would walk in that you'd never see. That'd be like, I want that table right there now. And you're like, no. And you're like, why? Aren't you democratic? And like, no, the person who's been here a thousand times is going to get that yeah. table. Who are you? And so I feel both, both sides of it. And I think it's perfectly legitimate not to be able to sell something to somebody just because they, they come in and want it. Except for me. <laughs> but I think mean, that's something interesting. Um, that it really, if you wanted a painting and you couldn't get it, literally the next day, there's another one. There's a different artist. A different a different artist. artist. That we, we get bombarded so much with, I mean, I can't anymore, I, I can't open a key up. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but, but, but it's good, but at the same time, it just it really like resensitizes you, and then it becomes something like, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe you should go on finally take a look at not buy on Instagram, you know, like just go take a look at the artwork because everything is visual and it's so much, it's just a lot. So if you miss one, you can't get it, it's, it's impossible, then just wait because the next day, if you, if, you got, if you caught the bug of collecting, there's going to be something else the next day and the day after, like maybe five more the day after. I mean, I can buy something I want every I have to know that it's computer is so sad. He <laughs> said that he sent it to me and Harry it said uh, no art purchases. <laughs> 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 I'm like, well, because when you stop, it just you know, yes. something else that you said I think about a lot because um uh, Avo, Harry, who's in this audience somewhere, and I, what do we text maybe like from five 50, a. 60 uh, times, <laughs> 50 or 60 times a day at least, and it's always new PDFs, new PDFs, and I really understand what you said about getting not only desensitized, but you also feel like you're seeing the same thing. And I think it's something that allows you to think, okay, am I seeing a trend in the night? And then am I just jumping on the trend? Or is this really interesting? Or does it look like everything else I'm seeing in 2024? But I mean, it's really, so what I'm saying is just, just find your guru, find your gallery, and really stick with it, and then slowly learn from them, and then and then if you can't get something, or if it's too expensive, it's okay. Because I, mean, it was, I remember trying, like when I first started, I mean, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, yeah, Andy Warhol was expensive, but we bought probably the cheapest Andy Warhol probably, I don't know. But it was a lot of money for us. And I made payments, $1,000 a month, 
for whom I don't remember how long. I have the invoice that I wrote down every month that I made a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars. So you can they will work with you, galleries, when they see someone and they will work with you to make a payment. I don't know. They're galleries in here. Would you do that or no? So it's 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 possible. So that's that's the approachable way. And and even the galleries that don't want to sell you, trust me, there will be a time where they're gonna come and they want to sell sell you something because they all everybody like any business, they go through ups and downs and then they they, they, they come back to you and say hey you know like by the way they want to start to make okay, let's talk you know so so that there is that I guess the niche. Now, tomorrow night, I'll always tell you about everyone. And they think we have a kitchen too, so <laughs> so I'd say we'll say it's just Well, no, what's that said? Everything is for sale. Mm -hmm. These cattle statements. Yeah. <laughs> there are also different types of galleries. If we're sitting right now in a gallery, which is also a curatorial practice. And I discovered one of the artists that they had, an artist in residency, Mary Carapetian, who literally made two of the most stunning installations. And, and I had, you know, up until that time, it was all like paintings, I, I feel safe in paintings. I was so moved by this work that I acquired this installation. Honestly, I'd love to donate it because Mary was kind enough to um, come to our home when she was visiting from France and help us install it, which my son's obsessed with her. He's like, whatever, he's like a little art camper. Um, but it's just, there's always some magic, I guess, to be discovered. And even though we talk about really big price points or these really intimidating situations, I mean, this curatorial program is just such a great example of how you can discover an artist you never know about otherwise, who, by the way, is now going to be, like you said, in the Leon Biennale, and it's just things kind of just take off organically if you put the time into actually seeing and exploring and learning and discovering. Um, I had one question on payment plans. I don't know if we want to talk about that more. My question was basically, are payment plans still a thing? Yeah, and it sounds like they are. They are, yeah. I mean, could you also mention like buy one, get one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, payment plans happen. They happen in galleries, they happen in auction, um, you know, depending. Um, yeah, they happen in auction, but you have to have them approved for prior. You have to ask for them approved prior, and it, it does have to be over a certain uh, value, although depending on how the, the economic situation is, sometimes you have a little bit more leverage. Um, and you can negotiate anything. I mean, really, galleries are open. They want you to have pieces. So if it's to help you pay over a year in small payments, big payments, smaller galleries are a little bit more amenable in terms of longer term as long as you're consistent. I have a lot of clients who do it on the you know top end. Um, when you really want something and that's how it's gonna happen, you make it happen and the person will work with you. Um, auction, gallery, I don't know if artists do it, but um, you know, I, I, a lot of my clients do it. And it doesn't matter how financially um, healthy your situation is, why not if you can um, do it, a lot of people do it. Um, buy one, give one. I don't know if you guys want to talk about that. I just want to say something before you. Um, yeah. So the, the thing is that the one thing you have to remember when you do the payment plan, you will not get the painting or whatever oh, it yes. is. Until yeah. after yeah. you pay it all off. So yeah. that's the yeah. way. So there's not that. Yeah. 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 Game art special. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to remember that. But, uh, and I hate when people learn this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there is a practice in the art market of buy one, give one, um, which is, you know, if an artist is very much in demand or only makes a few pieces, like what you we were, we were explaining, uh, a gallery sometimes feels that the way they can, um, how shall I say this, encourage donations to institutions is saying, well, if you want one, you have to buy one, donate it to X museum. Some galleries will give you the choice of which institution you would like to get, but then on the flip side, you have to ensure that the institution would like to receive that gift, um, which is always not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, and on the flip side, sometimes you can buy one, donate it, and they will tell you where you're going to be donating it to. 
Um, and either you'll be able to acquire a work from that show or the artist will make you a piece commensurate with the piece that you are donating. There are many different uh, formulas, let's say. I have an opinion. I hate it. I, I, I agree I with you. As I said, I said, I'm I hate for it. this. Every part of it. I think that basically, what my wife Laura and I collect, we don't have the money to give something to an institution just so we can have. That's one of the reasons. Um, I find it um, elitist. I find it um, collecting. Yes, and no, it doesn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't have to be. You know, I want to know it's why people don't have it outsider art fair and you get great art and it's not that expensive mm -hmm. and um i just think it's setting up um a system that i think is nasty and if museums want to buy it they should get enough people on their trustee trustees where they can afford to get it and not depend on you know private individuals such as yourself to do it you should have to do that well and that's how i think and also so little public funding for museums. I mean, you go to Europe and like, oh my gosh, these museum private collections are incredible because the curator, I mean, it's just so much more planned in terms of breadth and depth. And in the United States, it's exactly, not like who's donating. But you know, you have to remember also that, for example, the Pompidou <coughs> has, uh, has friends of Pompidou yes. here that actually people give, uh, give or whatever pieces to the Pompey do that they get a tax induction here in the States because they open the client who wants to do it here in the States. So you can get the Pompey do, so that's not 100%. <coughs> but what I wanted to say about this gift giving, my favorite part is galleries calling us about, like we work with Whitney and the RISD and, and they want to put a, somebody in the way. It's not, you know, Whitney's not just not going to say yes to anything. Yeah. They, they really like, you know, they have 20 curators. They all they not all have to agree, but they have to be like, you know, they all have to say, okay, yes, we want this one. I have presented from galleries because they don't work with them. And they have said, literally, what what has this artist done to art history? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's what they, I mean, happened twice to a very famous artist, which mm -hmm. everybody wants. And I was like, whoa, okay. And then the next one is the gallery calls you and they're like, the Whitney only takes you know, American artists or artists who are either born here but work elsewhere, or you know, they, they're like gray areas where they would accept artists as well that are not necessarily American, but it is an American. My favorite one is when galleries say, hey, can you put this like, I don't know, like foreign artist in the Whitney? And I'm like, no, can you put this in the I mean, no, it's like, it's all, I mean, please. It's like, well, we had we had a funny incident. It was actually the day I met you at, after freeze. Um, there was a work that I inquired about, and I just wanted to learn more about the artist and the work. And the answer I immediately heard from the galleries was, "This work is going to an institution." Oh. And she said, "Okay, I literally just wanted to ask you a few questions, but I get it. It's the IP day. You have like more important people to talk to than me. Fine, sure." Um, so Lisa's point. That's maybe not like a gallery I want to work. Anyway. Um, but then later, I have either lunch or dinner with Olmo, and I tell him about this, and he's like, oh, what work is that? And I show it to him on my phone, and he's like, no way. I was the institution. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody didn't so, want that work. No, they didn't want that work. They, they wanted the work that was, you know, they, they, want, you know, they wanted to work that was more uh, emblematic. They wanted to draw the exactly. work. Uh, yeah. And then the artist did drawings. Yeah, the so they wanted drawings and nothing. Yeah. So, so instead, that painting went to the other. So she wasn't. She, I, she wasn't I, lying. Well, she wasn't. <laughs> I never told her that we were doing that. Painting. You're not caught. I love that. Our world is very small. You think it's very big, but you always find everything out. That's true. People, people talk. So yeah. just be a good person, please. Yeah. Well, easier to be a good person than be a jerk. Um, so, are you saying what's not? So, I guess I want to ask two more questions before we wrap up and maybe take a question or two from the audience. Um, so, so far, we, 
been talking about primarily acquiring works from galleries. What about acquiring work directly from an artist? I know each of us has, yeah. has had experience with that. Yeah. And so what are the positives? What are the drawbacks? I mean, for me, the positive is I mean, the price is obviously lower, but obviously you also get to talk to an artist and get to know an artist more on a personal level. And a lot of times those artists who at the time weren't represented then went on to be represented by galleries. Um, but the drawback is that a lot of artists aren't, especially really great artists, are not the best business people or the most organized, and it can be hard kind of actually getting the work eventually. Um, so can you each speak to your experiences of firing directly from the artist, and or do you have a role that's like, I will not do that, I don't want to deal with the headache? Well, I, uh, I was special. And for the last 20 years, a special case, I actually, not only did I purchase directly from artists, I mean, not many, but some, but I've also traded with artists. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a very, very difficult conversation also because you want to help them and they are very happy. And I've also worked with artists who actually are amazing and have a fantastic experience where they send their whole studio to like the big artists that have 20 people and they cover everybody to do their demo work. And that's a couple of those amazing, amazing scripts. But there are some people who they feel like, oh, I'm giving you a piece of art and I'm going to work, but it's like, it's like a gift or something. But no, I'm, you pay for it. You know, it's not like, you know, it's transactional, and, but they don't get that because I don't know why, because they're artists or because they don't think about it. Or, you need to change the mental Yeah. Yeah. Like we do. Yeah, so it's like it would be a favor or something. Well, oh. you're not, you're not really. So, so, mm -hmm. so there's a double edged sword. So, you know, like it works beautifully, and at the same time, it doesn't. And then sometimes some artists haven't told their galleries. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a huge problem where I have to like tell them, you either tell them or I'm telling them. Yeah. So, so there's a lot, of, you know, but it took time to get that level of security and in what I do and collecting, you know, it wasn't so easy. I'm like, well, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to do this. I'm like, yeah, I want to help you, but let's keep it between us. And then you think about it, like, it's all wrong. It's all, you know, it doesn't, nothing, nothing works, but except those ones that are like really open and they know they're giving you a piece of art because they want to take care of their employees. You know, that's a <coughs> Somehow they cannot afford to buy them dental insurance. And dentistry is expensive, so, so that worked out very well with a few people, and it worked out very well with all those smaller, like some some stuff that I've traded, nothing happened. It's like it's sitting in my storage. I don't really like it. I did it because I wanted to help them. And at the same time, you know, there are some that I was like, well, I really wanted, and then it became like this crazy thing. Mm -hmm. And then they become like upset because now, oh shit, I gave this painting for like a few fillings, and now it's worth so much money. <laughs> So then they, what happens then? You know, they get they, they get like overwhelmed. up. And even though even though I have the tenex that said, Otto, you do whatever you want, you will you know, you were one of my earliest uh, you know, people who helped me out, you know, supporters. But things change, you know, they speak to their friends, their galleries, they mean, oh shit, I shouldn't have done that, or I did this, or you know. It's like it's like anything that happens in the world with you, but not necessarily, you know. I mean, these are just human problems that you yes, I do you know, know. I don't do it. I, no. no, it's not, not that something really bad happened, but I also sold my practice, so I'm not allowed. <laughs> oh. uh, my rule is very simple. If the artist has a gallery, we don't buy directly from their studio. And, you know, as I was describing earlier, you know, we do focus on you know your base artists simply because we can visit their studios, we can stay in touch, we can follow their career, but that doesn't mean they have to exclusively be in New York. Mm -hmm. However, most of them are, which means that their galleries are also our friends. So it's a it's a actually a very small world. So it's you know just not I, I don't buy from the studio unless it's an artist who is unrepresented, and if they're unrepresented. Yes, of course, <laughs> but mostly just to support them and to sort of, you know, show them that, you know, we like their work and so, but unless they have a, of course, if they have a gallery, they're working with someone, I don't like them, 
that's great. Exactly, yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, that, I think that's great advice. I mean, the only times we've really bought uh, directly from artists is, you know, when they haven't been represented or they're between galleries and they are selling um, and maybe they have a lull in their career. I, let, I do what you do all the time. I go for the um, mid-career quiet ones nobody's paying attention to and a lot of times some of them are in between gallery and they're so happy to have you in their studio and you can do a lot of um, sales that way. But um, really do it through the galleries outside of, if they're represented, yeah, it's predominant. Unless it's a gift for something, right. which artists do give gifts. I also feel like it's really awkward. Like, it's awkward to be in some like studio you because you have to be like, oh, that's lovely. It's not. <laughs> and, um, that's the worst. The worst. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of times artists are people too, and many of them are not nice or, or weird. And I'd rather, <laughs> judge, I'd rather judge them by their art than their personality. And it's another thing about getting to know the artist is I find there's there's a part of it that's almost condescending, like that you have to prove the artist to buy the work. I, I just think that I, I actually don't want to know that like, at all. It's, it's so much easier. And it's really about something we've all been saying. It's, it's foster the relationship with the gallerist. Like, Nicole from Chapter is here, and Nicole and Allison are the best, and I trust them. And they've actually said to me, don't buy certain things. And because they know me, they know what I like, and they've, they've formed a relationship with me where I really trust them. Or I go, you know, I'll go in and marry and I show each other stuff every day. And we will bounce stuff off of each other, like, what do you think? You know, a lot of times the other person's like, I know you like it, but I think you should think about it. And that's more helpful than that. Yeah, but Stephen also has stranger danger, so he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be there anyway. <laughs> so, I'm going to complete this. But I mean, as far as like galleries, I mean, I like to collect them. Old and or yeah. You just have to worry about pride on stuff. <laughs> I mean, as far as for meeting artists, it just has not been easy. So that I don't do it. And I just, I just, because then something weird happens, like you invite them to your house and then they get drunk like crazy, and then you <laughs> spill the lobster on your know, it's not happening. That's my experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I just want one to thank everyone for coming. Um, so I, I found these answers really fascinating. I just wanted to interject. I didn't know how to do it. I wanted to interrupt. So I started like I figured it showing us followed like I, I basically called her mom's mom and my school and said, Can I buy your loft? And we just like pushed it up on the walls, right? And then I called us friends with this girl whose father was a astrophysicist from Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, Alan Harvey. And she started to paint. And I was like, oh, so I like, well, I would just buy her shit for like $20. And, and then one day I called her and I said, you know, I want to stop working in advertising. Do you mind if I sell your stuff back? And she's like, this is British or she's too funny. Like, you know, save them one day, you can the off of them. Just wait for me. So I, I think it's very organic. Like my friend Sarah Meltzer opened a gallery, but she closed her gallery. And, I think it's very, um, you know, we have like the Gans in the audience, and they're trying to go pay more to our painters. Everything we sell are from maybe one or two people. It's, it's beautiful work, it's affordable, we'll work with you. So it's very, it's, um, there's no one rule, is what I want to say. And it's true, like if you want to buy a David Harris you're kind of out of luck, but fair. Why is someone taking a shark? I can do that. Um, but so I think you have to be flexible, like think of it as a, as a joy. And if, if you want to come to our gallery and talk to Tamar or me, you can do it anytime. And then we'll tell you what we know. If we don't have it, we'll introduce you to other people. Um, I think of it as not as like rigid as, you know. And if you're lucky, I mean, maybe a couple of those aren't things that I thought were cute when we used to next to Pam. You know, and I was like, oh, you're a photographer. So sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, another question. So I'm going to give it back to our moderator. Thank you. Anyone have questions? Harry. 
become very successful. How do I know that? Because one of my patients went to his like fancy, big, huge townhouse in Chelsea, and I'm like, are you kidding me? This guy like, has no nothing. And now he's completely crashed. Like the guy didn't pay his bills, and like he's gone. He's nowhere to be found. So it's, it's fascinating. Ten years of people to go through this whole like thing. Was I right? Yeah, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> But the reason why I like to meet the artist is because, and it usually you know, I would see the work and then would want to meet the artist, it's because, and mostly with, or I want to meet the artist whose work I really like. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, as I said earlier, for me, when I see the work that I really like, it just triggers or provokes this like crazy reaction that nothing else does. That for me except seeing art. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, I am, you know, get yourself composed. You are a normal person. Don't make a scene. Like, don't start crying for no reason. So that does truly happen to me often when I see the work of art that I like. So then I'm like, okay, how the hell is this possible? Like, I want to meet the person who is able to make this work or this object that I just like respond to without any rationale. So it's really curiosity, mm -hmm. and also artists are, we all are people. I don't think they're any different than us, except for, you know, anyone else, except that this is, again, just my opinion, but I feel like artists are really great, and I feel in that, that they are using, they're, you know, putting themselves out there through these, like, objects that people are seeing and judging and commenting on and having opinions about, so I think it's really hard to do that. I personally have a lot of feelings, but I wouldn't dare to put them out there like that. So, you know, so that other people can say like, oh, this sucks. Yeah, but that's no fun. No, I know, but it's just like me, you know, it's like how, and that's really why I like to meet the artist. It doesn't really have to do anything with like, oh, do I wanna, is, you know, do I wanna continue to collect their work or not? It's just like, I am so out of my mind over this work could you please like just say hello to me? And like that would be good. And you know, friends joke around like I could literally be sitting next to Brad Pitt, I could care less, like honestly, but then I can sit next to an artist I like and I like sound completely unkinched because I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you don't know me, but I know. And I all know you and I'm like, oh she my hand. Maybe we should reserve the last question for artists. <laughs> Who's an artist raising your hand? Linda, Ron, or Ron? Okay. My, my husband is an artist. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks. Oh, you do? Can you collect his work? Yeah. Oh, his work is really, and I don't really an Alan knows, but oh, it's really just a joke because his work is. Oh, oh, fun. Oh, no, it's not work. No, no. We eat under the bed. Or wherever storage or whatever. <laughs> so, are we getting it? Are we getting a question? Are we getting a question? There are no other questions. So, I'm a sculptor, and a lot of my work would be hard to live with. You know, I make these tabletop sculptures that have a lot of like, miniature pieces. Um, so, as collectors, like, I mean, I, I, it seems like a lot of you live with the work. So, do you take these? These issues and considerations. Yeah. Yeah. So they have to hang on the wall. You collect a lot of ceramics. I collect a lot of ceramics, but specifically, um, um, or, 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 I have a beautiful, Laura and I have a beautiful table by Kari Iran, um, uh, Israeli American artist who, um, 
No, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. And the uh, here with the uh, Intercrafts. Yeah. Amazing work. Um, and I've actually visited his studio and he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> but it has been in storage since the time we bought it. There's no place to put it. Um, and it's kind of impossible, and there's a certain sadness about it. And, um, Would you gift it? Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. um, well, but it's like anything else. Like, and this is a good example of like he was hot, 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 hot um, when he was with Gavin Brown, and you know now he's become a big career artist. He's still he's getting better and better every year. Um, he is going to be important. And uh, but now he's not that emerging hot, hot, hot artist, so it's it's difficult to get. Um, and we've you know we want to. Um, so so it's a great question because uh, and and I always tease people when I say oh I, you know I'm very bourgeois it, it can't fit somewhere but it but it's true like a lot of times unless you're immediately going to say this work is so great I'm sending it to the Whitney. Um, you're probably not going to be able to live with it. But since it's so grand for our team, they're doing so many things. So you guys want to work with us. It doesn't just do sculptures. So our area, we, we, have, we have a table as well, but we don't have to risk it. That's all you can do. But he also makes amazing uh, wall pieces. And they live, they can live with it. Yeah, but you just want to be difficult and buy something difficult. Yeah. Uh, Yuji, uh, uh, what's his last name? Agamatsu. 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 But when um, I think it's also true because when I bought some old mosaics that are made of wax, um, someone else was like, oh, just build your own cabinet. And I was like, that's more expensive than art. And they kind of um, crumbled on the bottom. So, well, that's conservation. That's a whole other thing. I know, but I don't know if we should talk about that. Right. 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 When you do meet the artist, do you often, I mean, if it's somebody who's work you really resonate with, right? Do you find that you have a lot in common with them and, and that they're easy That's to talk with and you have a, a, a similar, a sort of a simpatico kind of relationship with them? That's a great question. No. You don't go to, I mean, I don't. I mean, just a computer thing. I don't go to a studio thinking I want to be at that. <laughs> So, so I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, I don't think I don't know if at, my, at this stage of my life if I want to go have dinner with people I just met. So, well, I think when we, when we go to the artist studio, right. we want to engage with them. We want to understand what they're thinking, what their thought process is. We don't. It, it's nice to you know have dinner with them sometimes, but you know, for someone like me, I go for my clients. I go for myself. I go to educate myself. Sometimes I don't even own the work. I haven't sold the work to a client. I don't want it personally, but we have to learn. And the way you're going to learn, sometimes you meet an artist who you think you necessarily connect with the work, but then you meet them and you understand a little bit more the crux of where they're coming from, and you start to look at their work a little differently. So I think there are many different. Uh, nuances when you do meet an artist, you have to keep an open mind, you know. And you're right, Stephen. Sometimes they don't share the same beliefs you do. Right. Um, but you know, I think like meeting anybody anywhere, it's important to engage in a certain way, and you make your own judgment and how that's going to affect how you look at the artist, your choice. I think where we're going with it is: Do you think like there's a certain wavelength that you're on that makes you attractive? I mean, if there, if so that people that you want to meet, like she really wanted to meet certain artists. Right. If, if you have that kind of a connection, do you right. find that that connection actually oh, yeah. has nothing to do with you? Yeah. Sure, of course. Please. No, just very quickly, when I say I like to meet the artist, that doesn't mean I have to meet them in like a formal setting. Like, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go to their studio and we're going to spend hours together. You meet artists in like, maybe even if it's in passing, and I would say hello, and like, we can 
that's really what I mean. For me, any interaction with an artist whose work I admire is, I enjoy it. It's, I don't want to say meaningful, but for me it is. Because again, like, I'm just so curious, I'm so touched, and it doesn't have to evolve. It's like something that I can hold close to me, and we don't have to be friends, and I know it's also weird, I recognize that. Like, I have this reaction to what they're doing, and they're looking at me like, I'm sorry, have we met? And I'm like bawling in front of them. So no, I don't have to be best friends at all. It's just that I, again, admire what they do, what they put out, I think it's crazy, it's like, you know, it's a great show. They put things out there for other people to yeah. So, 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 you, you, you've never had any, like, you met someone and you're like, oh my god, this guy is like, yeah. or this woman is not. Yeah. Like, this weirdo, I, I, I don't want to do this, like, never? No, I've had a situation where uh, an artist whose work, we don't own her work, but I went to hear her speak about the work, it really didn't resonate with me. So of course, there are, I'm not saying every time I meet an artist, I'm just, you know, it, it's, it doesn't click every single time. But when I see the work or I'm in front of the work and I have the reaction that I was describing earlier and I'm deeply drawn and like, you know, deeply moved by work, good or bad, even if I see something and I'm like, oh my God, like, this is scary, but like, I'm still unsure why this emotional thing is happening. But for sure, I went to artists' talks before and what they were saying didn't necessarily resonate. But again, I always do try to think about, and this is just a little you know, side story. When I was younger, I played volleyball and like at a crazy competitive level back in Serbia. So, you know, people would be on the stands with my parents like talking shit about the players and it's like oh you know she's just like hitting today like she hasn't slept in a week and, like, <laughs> have you tried doing that and really, i think that's kind of stuck with me so now any art i see i am like i have respect but, but, but just, like, just like there are some uh, collectors that are imposters there are artists that are imposters. yeah yeah for sure so for sure. sure and i have met them so i'm no, just I a few but that's what I mean, just for me, I don't know. But also your collection is like 20 times, literally the size of mine. <laughs> Maybe 30? I don't know. Uh, all right. What's your last question? I think you're allowed to ask. Thank you. So a lot of our collectors, I, uh, my voice is loud. A lot of our collectors send the artwork that they collect directly to the storage. It doesn't go to their home, and some of them tell us about the tax benefits. I don't understand. Can someone please explain? Yeah, I don't do that. You don't do that. Okay. Is I there a benefit to sending the work to storage and being yeah, not to sell no, it? I, I, there's, I, only, I, I, there's only a benefit to sending it to a state that doesn't do it. Not even to so, so the way the way, 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 postponing the tax payment. And now you can't even send it to California because we, 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 do, we do have to we used to have a house there, but you cannot send it there because all galleries have a California. <laughs> so yeah, yes. like if you buy whoever you buy from, they have a California branch. So you have it also depends how much the gallery is Correct. selling the yeah. revenue in yeah. each state. Yeah. So if you have a home maybe in South Dakota, they're really not selling to a lot of people there. If you won't have to, and you have a home there that you send it to, you won't have to pay. But uh, it, it depends on how get. Yeah. Well, it depends again because if they sell a lot in Connecticut, there's a threshold, and if the gallery meets that threshold, they have to start charging tax. So you have to have conversations with. They also have to be really careful because it used to be like, oh, we live in Connecticut, we can just go to the gallery in New York and pick it up, and that's over. Like they have to ship it to us. I feel like I'm half a socialist. Pay the sales tax. Agree. New York totally needs agree. the money. For the infrastructure, you're rich. Pay your sales tax. Well, yeah, thank you 
also, I would like to ask someone today's session. We have one of these Berlin discoveries, Carl Cleveland, who teaches at Parsons, who's a sculptor and a very important artist. Comments will be really fun. We have the two towards the